and explore the connections between religious and political radicalism and social radicalism in in London generally, but in particularly in North London and Northeast London, and um, try to see if we can find any continuity and, and long-term connections between the, um, the, the meeting houses history that you might be familiar with and you're becoming familiar with, and other trends in religious radicalism and political radicalism and, and earlier trends. And I'm going to speak very generally because um, I'm going to begin, as is sometimes traditional, with an apology and say I'm not a specialist on the history of the, of the, the meeting house. Um, so if there are things that are not clear or things that you'd like to pull up, pull me up on or bring, try to bring out in, in discussion, pop them in the chat box and I'll try don't think I'm finding it easy to monitor the chat box and have the slide, the sharing screen share open. So it might be that rather than being able to answer as I go along, which is what I hoped I'd be able to do, I might have to do it at the end, if that's okay, Amy, because I'm just looking at the, I can't find the chat box, chat box. But let's, I, I suppose this is, this is, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of one way at the moment uh, because you've all kindly muted for uh, Zoom purposes. But I hope that this is more like a, a, a workshop rather than just a straightforward lecture where um, I'm like any good nonconformist um, preacher of the 17th century, I'm kind of taking the role of Moses with the Ten Commandments coming down from the mountain. I don't want to be in that role, if you forgive me, the analogy. So I'll just make a start. So I, I'm. Um, showing you the image and just thinking more generally of, of, of the site and thinking more generally about that why in 1708 this particular institution came into being and how it connects up with the, the, the landscape, the social topography, um, the, the political history of of London, of England, um, in the period just before, leading up to the beginning of the 18th century. Anyone knows about the 17th century, the, the next, the previous 100 years, previous 150 years, will know that, um, uh, and again, just trying to find the roots of the political radicalism, uh, which is most closely associated with um, people like Mary Wollstonecraft will know that <clears throat> the, the institution was founded um, at a time uh, when England, only just becoming Great Britain after 1707, when England had, and indeed the whole archipelago, had been undergoing a century of revolution um, in which um, after the accession of the Stuarts in 1604, there had been a long period of religious conflict, uh, increasingly fractious relationship between king and parliament, which had resulted in the civil war, the overthrow of monarchy, uh, the execution of the king, the establishment of uh, a republic um, in the form of the Commonwealth, and then itself being overthrown, um, after going through a period of, of um, political turmoil with the creation of a short-lived protectorate under Oliver Cromwell, monarchy is restored under Charles II in 1660. And that doesn't, the story doesn't end there. There's, there's, there's a, yet another period of political upheaval which sees Charles II's brother, James II, who was Catholic, being pushed out in what was effectively a kind of palace coup and his place being taken by the joint monarchy of William and Mary. Um, and at the time of the um, foundation of the chapel that um, uh, 
that monarchy had ended and a new monarch under Queen Anne, had, who was a Stuart, had, had just come to the throne and England's about to be unified with Scotland. But it's a period of a political upheaval, religious upheaval, revolution, and radicalism. And it's that story I'd like to, to, to pursue. This is a map from the middle of the 18th century uh, from John Roke's map of 1761. Sorry about the poor resolution, uh, it's a bit pixelated, but as you can see, um, there's Newington Green um, and there's um, Stoke Newington. Um, and just thinking about the broad context, you've got the new river snaking its way through um, North London. Um, what is the old um, Roman road from London to Lincoln and to um, the Scottish borders is very important, still very important prominent route going from um, in, 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 in the 17th and early 18th century through London, um, from London through Kingsland, and then another route, an old droving route, um, which is Green Lanes, which is one of the longest roads in London. It's an old kind of cattle droving route into Smithfield. And along its way, and this is the, the main point, it, you are looking at the landscape of what is effectively rural Middlesex, a uh, huge county which streps, stretches around London. And by virtue of its proximity to London, the villages of Middlesex, including Newington, uh, Stoke Newington, and uh, Hackney, and Dalston, and Islington, modern borough of Islington, uh, but centered on the old um, center of, of um, Mary Islington, were being colonized. These villages, which were places to which, uh, which were basically kind of food production, production, um, market gardening, um, uh, pasture for cattle, and uh, you can imagine at the time, this very, the city that's growing from um, approximately 300,000 people in the beginning of the 17th century to by the time the chapels founded, over half a million and becoming the largest city in Western Europe. And with it, um, a huge demand for food, and so there's sort of cattle on the hoof and sheep being brought in from all over Britain from, uh, from uh, at the time, moving on those, those drovers routes. But because of the growth and wealth of London, the suburb, the, the, these areas, this, as it were, rural par uh, villages were increasingly becoming uh, colonized by well-to-do Londoners. Um, by merchants of the city of London who would um, build, can't quite call them holiday homes, but second homes um, uh, all over Middlesex. And of course, the same thing's happening south of the river um, in um, the metropolitan parts of Kent and Surrey. And these are the areas that, of course, Greater London in the, 20, in the 19th and 20th century with the coming of the railways and later on are suburbanized and kind of turn into modern London. But then, very rural, but close to London, less than half a day's ride, you know, just a few hours on horseback or foot from the city itself. That's really important to understand because that's the kind of deep context in which um, the radicalism and dissent were about to to talk about comes about. This is an image of, as you can see, of um, um, iconoclasm, uh, acts of uh, symbolic violence against statues, um, something that's not new and something that's a deeply rooted in um, the history of radical religion and reminds us that um, this is an image which dates roughly from the time of Edward VI reign in the middle of the 1550s, that this period is preceded by the great onset of the Protestant Refor Reformation. And again, without going too far back, um, from uh, the time of um, the 
uh, Martin Luther's uh, 95 theses, um, uh, break, uh, challenging the status of uh, the power of the Church of Rome to grant salvation, um, there was in England very quickly a series of, of movements which picked up on Lutheran teaching. Um, some of those movements found uh, support at the court of Henry VIII. That led to a political break with Rome, but very much a kind of unfinished uh, um, series of reforms. S gathering speed in the, in the reign of his son, Edward VI, who was, was raised by and tutored by religious radicals, but then the clock being stopped and indeed reversed at his death uh, in the early 1550s in the accession of his deeply Catholic elder stepsister, Mary, who um, set about um, repressing uh, Protestantism uh, and, and the progress that it had been it had been made, and seeking to extirpate heresy as she saw it from the um, from the from from England, and that led to um, uh, the the very public um, uh, burnings of martyrs at Smithfield, um, but also. Um, investigations into um, clandestine groups of Protestants who continued to maintain the faith. And that's where, really where the connection with um, our area starts to begin. We have no records of any form of religious dissent really before the reign of Mary in the area. And it's um, effectively what Mary was doing was importing um, and the, the, the tool that the Catholic Church developed to, um, to cleanse itself of heresy into uh, the English Church uh, through the mechanism of ecclesiastical investigations into heresy, inquisitions, if you like. And this series of police actions of investigations resulted in the, in the, in the discovery of congregations of people who were called gospelers in North London. And one of the first of these uh, was um, at a pub which um, was on Islington Green, known as the Saracen's Head. Uh, and um, it was found that a group of people were meeting there uh, clandestinely, but uh, under the guise of uh, a theatrical performance. And um, this was very, very common uh, as a way of kind of getting around authorities for people would meet in, 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 in taverns and inns, which often had very large rooms at the back. Um, and, or they might meet um, on, um, in, there's, there's examples of this on, on a boat on the River Thames um, or elsewhere. So uh, it's the important point being is that the origins of dissent in London are often to be found in these kind of clandestine spaces, these locations which were, which could be authorities could, where people could evade the authorities. And, and they're to be found in, 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 in the suburbs of London and in the hinterland of London. So um, places like, if you know, Moorfields or um, Finsbury Fields or Spitalfields um, or the East End of London, the area around Wapping and Whitechapel, Outside the city walls, city, the city of London itself mostly was contained within the old, what we call the city now, the old Roman walls, but it was beginning to grow beyond those places. And if you wanted to, as it were, to have a kind of clandestine meeting of some kind, the best place to go was to, to meet beyond the, those places. And of course, further afield, um, places like villages like Islington or Hackney would have also been able to harbor these forms of dissent. This is an image from Fox's Book of Martyrs, uh, which shows uh, the, an execution that took place. Um, um, there's, there's, a, there's another story to be told about this, this isn't in congregation and what they were doing and so on, but I'll pass over that, but you get a sense of the, the origins of a nonconformist tradition in North London from this period. And uh, Mary's reign, of course, is very short. Elizabeth, the, the, uh, the, her, the other stepsister, 
uh, comes to the throne in 1559. And um, the hopes of people who had either been uh, seen martyr, uh, witness martyrdom, but who had maintained uh, adherence to the new religion as they saw it, um, were raised by the accession of Elizabeth. But there, and there were also other trends that were taking place. Many people had gone into exile, wealthier uh, or people with, with, some with some connections to the continent had gone into exile under Mary's reign, who then returned. Um, John Fox, for example, had been at, 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 at um, Geneva. Uh, and there, uh, uh, the Marian exiles, as they're known, the exiles under Mary had imbibed an even more austere form of Protestantism, which was being taught by uh, the famous French reformer, John Calvin, who had kind of set up a, a kind of theocracy at, at Geneva. And Calvinism stressed the literal, a kind of literal interpretation of scripture, um, a very, very, you know, a, a kind of um, emphasis on, on scripture as being the, 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 the only base of religion, but also with it a kind of austere form of religious worship, uh, a kind of religious radicalism, which challenged the, if, if uh, the idea that if a secular ruler was in some way violating the, the rules of God, that that empowered people to re rebel, uh, so that this, as it were, legitimizing a form of political revolt on religious grounds. Um, so those people came back and were expecting from Elizabeth um, uh, sort of similar continuation or revival of the reform that had been under Edward VI. And unfortunately, they were disappointed because Elizabeth's um, having witnessed um, the toing and froing of the religious um, uh, pendulum from the brother to her brother to her sister, sought to kind of set the clock at a point which was halfway between reform and the old faith, and to kind of bring about what she saw as a religious peace. And there were many people who were unhappy with that and felt that the the, the the, uh, the state church that Henry VIII had established was not yet cleansed of all its pre-existing Catholic remains, uh, saints' days, uh, various forms of rituals which uh, Elizabeth's church had retained. And those people um, wanted to, as they saw it, purify the church of, uh, of, of Catholicism. Hence the term that was used really as an epithet, as an attack on them, Puritan, which comes about, starts to be used in the 1560s um, to refer to a minority of people within the Anglican church who just weren't happy. And under Elizabeth, that, those groups are um, operating on the margins of legality and often, uh, particularly as the reign progressed, um, there's, there's, there's a, a that they're, they're, there's, they're not a movement as such. They're a series of really kind of often based around charismatic preachers um, who are often referred to sometimes as, they're often referred to as tub preachers because they would maybe in the back, again, in the back of the tavern, put themselves in a barrel, which was like a kind of makeshift pulpit. And if you think one of these barrels, what they must've been like to preach in, they would have doors at the back. So you wouldn't be sort of stuck in the middle of a barrel and then if the barrel tipped over, you'd fall over, you would get in and out. But it's a bit like having a kind of makeshift pulpit um, elevated in the back room of a pub or hedge preachers is the other term that was used, which is immediately takes us to our London suburbs because the hedge preachers were often these people would literally meet in the fields, um, uh, in places like Moorfields, Finsbury Fields, Spitalfields, and beyond. Um, uh, at certain times of the day to evade the authorities and have these open air meetings. And so um, that, um, these kind of individual meetings, these gathered churches as they sometimes are referred to, uh, uh, groups, um, start to kind of solidify into congregations in the next reign, in the reign of James I. Elizabeth dies in 1603 and succeeded by James 
um, formerly King of Scotland, uh, uh, James the Sixth of Scotland, who then becomes James the Sixth, uh, James the First of England, and um, it's just interesting kind of to think about these churches a little bit and who belonged to them and who um, who was involved in them, because from the start, these churches or these these gathered churches, these uh, led around hedge preachers and, and, and tub preachers were often very egalitarian in their social composition. Um, some of them, um, the, the preachers are often people from what historians call refer to as the middling sort. Um, that is the loose term often used by historians to denote the middle classes, but they might have come from uh, shopkeepers, uh, artisans, uh, groups like London had a very big textile industry and had weavers, in this case a weaver, or people involved in the various different craft industries in London. Um, there, are, there are kind of conventional uh, uh, men of the cloth who go through the universities and are educated who who preached these groups, but there are often other groups that were that were um, there uh, around um, literally artisans who become uh, self-taught um, ministers of religion. And a lot of the 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 early breakaway churches, and by the reign of James the First, these groups are sort of giving up on the Anglican Church and saying it's never going to be purified, it's never going to be reformed, it's mired in the stench of Rome and the old religion, we might as well set up our own separatist churches. That is starting to take, take shape. And those, that, that kind of sense of um, uh, separatist religion, breakaway radical religion, comes to the fore in the period of the reign of Charles I, the son of James I, just to digress slightly, Charles I, um, in complete reaction against what he saw as, as the, the kind of dangers of religious anarchy uh, to his own authority, because religion and politics were intimately linked up in his mind and in the minds of contemporaries, he sought to impose on England um, effectively a return to a kind of older form of um, religious traditionalism that almost to some contemporaries seemed to go back to the period of Henry VIII's reign, almost to go back to, without establishing the link with Rome, to Roman Catholicism. So he reintroduced incense in churches and bowing in the name of Jesus and all sorts of rituals that were really um, to advanced Puritans harked back to Rome. And he combined that with um, a very uh, exalted view of his own political authority in relation to Parliament, remembering that he's the son of a Scottish king who had, uh, comes from a very different political tradition. He's looking, Charles, that is, to the way in which the French kings often ruled without reference to local representative authorities. Parliament has within it represent, uh, MPs who come precisely from that kind of social class of the middling sort, um, who um, had uh, wanted to um, try to carry on reform. To cut a very long story short, by the middle of the 1630s, the relationship between King and Parliament is breaking down. Um, and um, on the streets of London, religious radicals are seeking to campaign, issue petitions, calling on the king to um, uh, negotiate with parliament, to listen to parliament. Indeed, by this stage, Charles I had effectively closed, used his prerogative authority to close parliament down and also to continue the act of reform, so and to get, and continue the Reformation. This image shows one of the biggest political demonstrations that takes place just on the eve of the Civil War, 
which was at the time of a execution of one of the king's ministers, the Earl of Stafford, who um, Charles I effectively handed over to Parliament at a moment of weakness uh, as a way of placating criticism of himself, and that turned into this huge political demonstration. Well, this, um, as, James, as Charles saw it, this political disorder um, led to a breakdown in royal authority, demonstrations on the streets, uh, a fear of anarchy, in the middle of which Charles sends his family away and leaves London, having attempted to um, suppress Parliament, leaves London in uh, early 1642, uh, only to return at the time of his trial and execution. Civil war begins. And I just want to emphasize, before we go any further, how important London was to Parliament and the close connection, the close uh, support, at least initially, that, part, that Londoners showed to um, the, the cause of Parliament. This is a, a narrow alleyway in the back streets of Spitalfields, now very much, much cleaned up uh, from the time this photograph was taken, uh, which is called Parliament Court. And it's um, uh, where uh, at the onset of the Civil War, young men of the city were recruited to fight in Parliament's armies and volunteered to their many thousands in early 1642 to go off and fight the king. London itself was ringed by a series of uh, defensive fortifications that were built by Londoners in, in groups, of, groups of young men and women going out much like um, what happened uh, in Leningrad in 1942 and that there's a sort of mass earthwork defenses were built and Parliament, uh, Londoners showed their support for Parliament by marching out to the, uh, the suburbs and building these earthwork defenses and again you can just see these, uh, some of these um, defenses give their names to certain streets and their sort of topography of London was sort of shaped around them because they were very extensive. Eventually they were, after the Civil War, they were uh, torn down. And you can see Islington is just at the very top of the map. Um, so um, London was a kind of treasure trove of Parliament. It was, it was a source of wealth, source of arms, a source of manpower. Uh, and um, for most of the early phase of the Civil War, although later there was uh, splits, uh, Londoners supported the cause of Parliament. They often, they later grew war, war weary, um, uh, and there were rebellions. Um, but before that happened, again, going over kind of very, very complicated toing and froing, taking, I don't want to take you away from London too far on the battle, to the battlefields of the Civil War, but the, what ultimately transpired was that um, uh, a new army was formed by Parliament, a new model army in which figures such as Oliver Cromwell emerged as the leading military figures. That, was, that army was itself politically very radical because it was uh, people like Cromwell recruited um, across social classes, unlike the king's armies, which were often the officers came from the aristocracy. In Cromwell's armies, the officer class were often drawn from uh, people from much further down the social scale. Um, and that army was very successful. It beat the king in battle. The king was brought back to, um, uh, as a prisoner. He escapes from prison and restarts the Civil War. And he's beaten again in 1648. And that led directly to his trial and execution. Now, that, 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 that's, uh, so you can see it's a really complicated story. In the ma that maelstrom of war and, re and the beginnings of a revolution, political authority, the ability to control people's ideas, um, uh, censorship of the press, all of that breaks down. And London becomes a hotbed for new ideas uh, and new ways of thinking. Uh, and you have people openly preaching um, ideas such as um, uh, very kind of religiously informed ideas about millenarianism, uh, the belief that, that, that um, 
the defeat of the king was a sign of God's favor on parliament and that this marked the beginning of an end of secular government and the reign of uh, King Jesus, the, the return of Christ on earth and the beginning of the, the millennium. Uh, there are others who were beginning to advocate ideas of um, universal suffrage or universal manhood suffrage. Um, Hugh Peters is a very good example of, one of, of, of a, a local connection uh, because he was one of these hedge preachers. He had been a, a chaplain to one of the parliamentary army source in the, during, the, during the wars. Um, in the time between the king's surrender and his execution, he was openly preaching in favor of the, the idea that the king was uh, responsible for the shedding of innocent blood and should be brought back to trial. So he's kind of one of those people in a sense who was instrumental in the the, the trial and execution of the king, and he preached in Islington and North London. We know to congregations at places like St. Mary Islington and further north and elsewhere in Hackney. So there's a there's a direct connection, and that of course leads to the the um, what was effectively a show trial, Charles the first trial in January of 1649, and his execution. Now, it's almost impossible for us now, I think, to appreciate the, the, the significance of the execution of the king. It was a European-wide event, uh, because you can see by this print, which is in German, there was a print of the execution of the king in all the major European languages. Kings were divine, you know, they were the, in a sense that the kings were God's anointed on earth, uh, and people literally believed in the divinity of kings. So, or at least those who supported the king did so. So the execution of the king was not merely the death of one person, it was the death of an institution. And parliament, in the aftermath of the execution of the king, not merely did not merely, as it were, sort of kill the king by this show trial that happened in uh, uh, the parliament house and he's executed outside of Whitehall Palace. They also voted to abolish monarchy in March of 1649. House of Lords was also abolished. Um, and create a commonwealth or republic. Now, it was a republic that was not democratic. Uh, it was not a modern liberal democracy by any stretch of the imagination. It was a theocracy, um, but it was nevertheless a republic. It was, it was called a commonwealth. It had no head of, monarchical head of state. And it's at this time that um, uh, whole, in this, in this, 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 chaos of, of, of overthrow, that different religious groups begin to publicly emerge. And they, they draw their traditions uh, and look back to, and this is, uh, again, uh, if, if this is not, this resolu resolution of this image is not, doesn't really kind of allow you to look at the de detail, but you've got these, it's, it's a, an attack on all the religious radicals of the 1640s and 1650s, and it shows all these different congregations and has their labels above them, uh, and some are, and it says, "Popery and masquerade," because the the attack that was made on the people who were in favor of the overthrow of the king, these religious radicals, um, said that they were effectively they weren't good at reformers, and that the death of the king was going to lead to the return of Catholicism, and they're showing it, it very sort of derogatory images, including um, a woman preaching is is the analogy is made with um, a dog speaking, and it's the idea that women preaching. How can you have that? So it's like it's it's as though an animal was were speaking, uh, but you've got images of um, uh, Quakers and Anabaptists and uh, and uh, Presbyterians and so on. Um, these are the groups that settled in North London, They're, and, and they, there are provincial, um, regional equivalents to these groups, but the North London link is firmly established in this period of civil war and revolution. Um, and without kind of going into too much of the theology of this and, uh, and what the content of their ideas too much, and that may, that's maybe something we can talk about in, in discussion, um, they, some of them look back to um, some of the early German reform movements, um, the, the time from the time of the German Reformation, uh, and they take their names um, or, uh, from, from that, Mennonites, uh, Melchorites, 
Bucheldians and so on. Um, others were uh, accused uh, of going even further back to some of the medieval heresies, such as the Cathars um, uh, or the, the, Hutt, the Huttites of uh, Bohemia of the, 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 the 15th century. In terms of their ideas, they are, they believed in, uh, they're often called, uh, labeled broadly as Anabaptist, and Anabaptism is just basically what we would think of as Baptist, uh, in the sense that it's the idea of adult baptism. That is, you, you couldn't belong to a church unless you voluntarily, uh, of your own accord, uh, vo agreed to join that church. And the way that you agreed to join that church was as an adult, being baptized because the tradition up till that time within the church, of course, was to baptize babies at birth. And of course, babies were not considered to be able to voluntarily join the church. So there's this idea of a volunteer, in terms of kind of politics, the significance of this is you have to kind of understand the idea of free will, of, of putting yourself, um, not being a member of the church because the state dictates that you have to be a member of the church because that's the state religion, Anglicanism, but you belong to a church because you want to belong to that church because you agree to belong, you, you, you volunteer to join that church. It's a gathered church, very important. I mean, it's almost like, in a sense, it's the beginning, if you like, of a kind of voluntaristic society. It's the idea of, uh, of you can almost see political parties to a certain extent emerging out of this whole concept of, of voluntarism. There are all, many of these groups are also millenarian. Uh, that is to say, they believed in, in the millennium. They believed in the coming of, of Christ. Uh, there's a sort of expectation that they are on the, on the verge of a great social transformation. Um, and the millenarianism is important in nonconformity right the way through into the age of the, the, um, the Unitarians. Uh, Richard Price was a, was a, had millenarian ideas, and uh, uh, they're also often um, primitive communists in that the sense of not um, uh, necessarily believing in a kind of Soviet state, but believing that uh, land. Uh, and resources, natural resources, should be more, should be shared in some way. Uh, they often believed uh, in some form of forms of commu communal agriculture, or communal settlements of, of various different kinds. Um, they were accused by their enemies of being um, sexual libertines uh, and and believing in free love uh, and divorce. Uh, it's important to point out that people like John Milton, who was living in London in this period, advocated the idea of civil divorce, um, which was impossible for, uh, to, to obtain during this period. So there's a kind of accusation um, of, of libertinism, and that, that was often a kind of unfair accusation. In fact, if anything, many of the, these congregations were, were in, in, in many ways quite, um, in, 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 in terms of, relations between men and women, marriage, divorce, and so on, were quite um, uh, puritanical, but to some they were accused of this. And of course, coming out of that, in terms of modern political radicalism, these moves towards voluntaristic, gathered churches, self-government, not being told by the state what religion you should belong to, there's a, there's a kind of, not libertine, but libertarian, um, Volunteerism, which manifests itself in, in in terms of the political arrangements and discussions around the Commonwealth, in terms of the idea of universal manhood suffrage, and of course the great, which many of you I'm sure will have heard of, political movement which comes out of this period is the Levellers, uh, and the Levellers uh, found their kind of earliest um, con uh, followers in the gathered churches, in these, these congregations in London, meeting in the suburbs, meeting in inns and taverns, meeting in um, uh, the fields around London, very strong following in the New Model Army amongst the enlisted men. Um, they began in the aftermath of the death of the king to draft constitutions, uh, uh, calling for uh, a new form of constitution. And many of the, the um, uh, for example, a very famous document called The Agreement of the People, which was de debated by representatives of the regiments of the New Model Army at 
the parish church of Putney on the River Thames um, at this time, uh, debates that were held with the representatives of the officer class. Um, in those documents, they called for s uh, political reforms which were not achieved in England until the, the Chartists or beyond, after the Chartists, uh, universal manhood suffrage. Um, uh, uh, they called for uh, triennial parliaments, um, uh, getting rid of, uh, making each part of the country relatively equally represented in parliament. It was, they weren't complete Democrats. They didn't sort of believe in universal suffrage. It was still for men. And there is a historical debate as to how democratic they really were. Nevertheless, for the 17th century, this is in the age of Louis XIV and absolutist government, they were very radical. And they were religiously inspired and they had a, a follow, a very strong following. And there were others. Um, and this is where, again, North London comes into play. The levelers were suppressed by the officers in the New Model Army very, very quickly af after the death of the king. A section of the army was sent off to Ireland, uh, where they were used very, the New Model Army was used very um, uh, repressively to repress uh, uh, Irish Catholics. And that's a whole other story. Um, but in the, Af and in London, uh, there were mutinies, uh, there were executions amongst the troops, the movement in the new model army was suppressed. And in the aftermath of the suppression, on the margins of society in London, uh, and in some other places, there were these, uh, groups of, uh, primitive communists who attempted to set up, um, communes, uh, in, um, areas where the land, the agricultural land was very marginal, where no one want, no one wanted, often called waste ground, um, uh, in, um, the Royal forests. Um, there, there, there are a handful of examples of these. And what's really important for us for purposes of tonight is they came from a lot of them come from the London suburbs or the London hinterland. So, um, the first, they were called, the diggers, these groups, and very famously led by Gerard Winstanley, who was the most prominent speaker, and they believed in growing uh, 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 food for themselves in communes on waste ground and common land. The first one was founded in um, just outside of London in St. George's uh, in Cobham in Surrey. Uh, and very quickly in 1649, after the death of the king, there were scattered communes were founded elsewhere including in the Chilterns outside of London. There were some in Buckinghamshire. There was uh, some in Kent. In our area, they were founded in Enfield, uh, on the ground, uh, near Enfield Chase. Um, and these very eph ephemeral, there was some in Windsor Park, which of course, after the king was in the hands of parliament, very ephemeral existences because the lords of the manor of these areas and the magistrates in these areas quickly repressed the diggers. Um, and so we just know very little. We just know that there was a commune uh, in, en uh, in um, Enfield Chase or in the southern part of Enfield Chase, so just beyond our area uh, that was founded in 1649. There may have been another commune somewhere in Tottenham, so, but um, so you, um, uh, this sort of primitive communism was seen as a real threat to society. Um, apologies if this is a slightly offensive image I'm about to show. Uh, there were other groups that were also active in London, uh, or at least accused by their their authorities of of, of free love, and that and the diggers were uh, these sorts of crude pamphlets were put up at the time to accuse the the, the diggers of harboring uh, these sort of sexual libertines that and and you know people getting together and taking their clothes off and dancing to a fiddle. I'll pass over uh, into this, and it's the. Um, many of the, the congregations that were founded in, are in North London in this period trace their roots back to this period of Cromwellian uh, the suppression of the, the levelers and diggers, the most famous of which are uh, the Society of Friends or Quakers. And, and Quakerism, which is associated with George Fox, um, comes to London um, in the 1650s, um, and it's, it, it, it grows out of that kind of millenarian, communalist, egalitarian, 
rejection of authority, rejection of hierarchy, um, symbolic gestures such as refusing to take off your hat, hence the, the, the wearing of the hat. Um, the sign of an acceptance of hierarchy was doffing the cap, you know, taking off your hat to your betters, and the Quakers refused to do that. Um, 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 the, 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 the idea that, that um, there was no difference between clergy and laity, that everybody had the right equally to speak and to speculate, and you didn't just, as it were, blindly recite from scripture, but you would speak as you were taken, as the spirit of God took you, and hence the sense of there being almost a kind of um, physical manifestation of the Holy Spirit in the individual by quaking, by literally kind of shaking or quaking, and those of you heard of the North American Shakers, well, comes out of a similar sort of, of movement. Um, and the earliest North London congregations, nonconformist congregations um, of the, the Restoration period were, 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 came out of this. You have people like James Naylor, very strange man, who uh, reenacted Christ's entry to Jerusalem by riding in to Bristol on the back of an ass with his followers holding palms in front of him on Palm Sunday uh, as a kind of act of religious rebellion. Uh, and he was um, punished by Oliver Cromwell for doing this by having his tongue bored uh, for blasphemy. Um, these groups, uh, uh, Naylor was in London and spoke to Quakers. Um, we know from later writings, the Quakers are meeting in places like um, uh, uh, taverns in Bishopsgate, a Shoreditch, um, again, Moorfields, Finsbury Fields, in, in the very same areas that I've been referring to. And what marks the Quakers out is that gender equality in terms of uh, religious, uh, the, the ability to speak at public meetings. And, and, and that, this was attacked by its authorities, you can see, um, in, in, the, in, the, in the early years of the, uh, during the Cromwellian period and in, during the early years of the restoration of Charles II, you start to get this um, um, attack on Quakerism for allowing women to speak as, they, as the spirit took them. So Cromwell is responsible for the repression and uh, in and, and is acting, although he himself is personally religiously radical, is acting at the behest really of the kind of propertied classes uh, of local magistrates of gentry who see in all these movements a threat to the social order and is using the full powers of the the state to do that. Um, the so it's a repression that's initiated by Cromwell, but in a sense it's ramped up even more after his death uh, and the restoration of monarchy in 1660 with the, with the return of Charles II, who using a kind of uh, packed parliament, packed with his supporters, seeks to turn the clock back literally to the 20 years, to the, 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 the point at which the Civil War began, imposing religious hierarchy, bringing back the, the full might of the bishops of the Church of England, and um, in the aftermath of his return, um, vengeance is wreaked upon his enemies. So the men who were, were responsible for find, signing his father's uh, death warrant, uh, the, those who had survived, the regicides who'd survived to 1660, who'd sat in parliament at the trial of Charles I, um, are executed. And if they died in the interim, their bodies are exhumed and then executed, so symbolically executed. Um, just to point out, Cromwell, who died in 1658, his body's dug up and then hanged, drawn, and quartered. Uh, Henry Ireton, of whom more in a moment, was equally um, uh, exhumed. His body was dug up and hanged, drawn, and quartered alongside of living men. Now, Charles's return does not lead to a total suppression of uh, religious radicalism. And there were people around after he comes back 
onto the throne who believed that by force of arms, uh, they could bring back uh, religious purity and get rid of monarchy again. They were known as fifth monarchists uh, based on in their interpretation of the second book of Daniel and the idea that uh, the fifth monarch you have uh, in the Bible, you have various different monarchs and then you have the, the reign of King Jesus, the fifth monarch, that would mark the beginning of the, of, uh, of the, the millennium. And they were going to be really in a, uh, a, a kind of clandestine um, um, insurgent army that would rise up and through it, Charles I knew about this, Charles II knew about this, and throughout the early part of his reign, we think of Charles II now as being the kind of merry monarch, the man who is responsible for rebuilding London alongside of Christopher Wren after the Great Fire, but in fact, he was a very repressive monarch and used all the power in his authority to extirpate what he saw as the the, this forces that have been responsible for the death of his father. This is where we come directly to our part of London, to N16. Because it was in those years, those early years of the 1660s, that you started to get people settling uh, in North London for a variety of reasons, who then become the nucleus of uh, nonconformity over the next 150 years. Men like Charles Fleetwood, now, Fleetwood had been an officer in the New Model Army. He'd been a, a kind of protege of Cromwell's, uh, who married Cromwell's daughter, Bridget Cromwell. Uh, and um, uh, um, settled um, in um, uh, Stoke Newington in the early 1660s. Bridget Cromwell, as you can see, had died. And Bridget Cromwell had a terrible, terrible end to her life. She had first married another parliamentary officer, Henry Ireton, who had been a major general in Cromwell's army, and he had died. And then after the restoration, she had to witness, she was forced to witness her, her husband's body, Ireton's body being dug up and then hanged, drawn and quartered. Her child's body, her child had been buried in some, uh, the, the, um, the church that's just next to Westminster Abbey, um, St. Margaret's, uh, the body was dug up, the, of her child was dug up as well, it was exhumed as a kind of punishment. She then, um, by this stage, had married, remarried Char Charles Fleetwood. She then dies, Fleetwood remarries, and Fleetwood marries, uh, this is the, the, just to show you the execution of Ireton and Bradshaw uh, and Cromwell. Fleetwood marries, a second time, a woman by the name of Mary Hartop was a, from a nonconformist background, um, and, there, and thereby acquires what becomes Fleetwood House, which was on Church Street. Uh, it later becomes, uh, appropriately enough, a Quaker girls' school, and settles there. And that's the first of a very good example of this is again Fleetwood House as it appeared in the 19th century of nonconformity in N16. Now, immediately impelling this and, um, and, 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 and really, in a sense, creating the area that you know and are, are hearing about is the repressive measures taken by the regime of Charles II against nonconformists. Um, his effectively prime minister, his chief minister for the early part of his reign, was a royalist soldier who comes back and is a noble follower of Charles the first and then Charles the son Charles the second Henry Hyde the Earl of Clarendon and he gets Parliament to pass a series of acts um, four acts of Parliament which are collectively called the Clarendon Code um, which were designed to stifle dissent in all its manifestations uh, effectively it meant that if you came from any of these religious backgrounds, you couldn't be a magistrate, you couldn't sit on a jury, you couldn't um, take part in elections, you were expelled from public office, that was the Corporation Act. It made the um, Book of Common Prayer, uh, so this is the Act of Uniformity, the Book of Common Prayer as revised by the Church of England, the only basis of worship. Um, the Conventicle Act, uh, which is part of the Clarendon Code, 
um, uh, meant that only uh, no more than five people could get together for any religious meeting of any kind at any one time. And for our purposes, the really important act is something called the Five Mile Act of 1664, which um, uh, forbade nonconformist ministers from preaching and from living anywhere with, uh, uh, within five miles of a cathedral. It didn't just apply to London, it applies to all over England. So you know, it, it meant that nonconformist ministers had to move away. And if you think about it, this creates the basis of um, all these men who had been, um, who'd come to be preachers, ministers, vicars, living at church livings during the Cromwellian period are expelled from their livings and can't live in London openly. So they have to move. And this creates the basis for a kind of nonconformist belt around London, which stretched from the east end of London, from places like Wapping and Whitechapel, through Hackney, uh, through Stepney and Hackney, all the way up into Stoke Newington, Islington, and Tottenham. And it's, it's a really interesting belt because it's a belt, if you like, that um, uh, stretches away from the court. It's on the opposite side of London from Westminster. Southwest London, there's a lot less nonconformity. West London, there's a lot less nonconformity. Um, and that reflects a kind of social divide in London between um, a kind of aristocratic, landed gentry, court-oriented, West London, and if you, if you, I mean, it, it sort of kind of still exists really in London. There's a kind of Southwest London, you know, if you think of the, the more benighted suburbs of Southwest London, it's kind of closer to, to the centers of court. North London, Northeast London um, is radical, it's nonconformist, um, and it's it, Paris, to take an uh, obvious comparison, we think of Paris as its red belt in the kind of 20, 19th and 20th century, it's kind of radical belt. And that's to the east and to the north of Paris. And it's very similar in, in many ways. Um, just to give you some examples uh, of what I mean, have people like John Owen. Um, and Owen is um, um, someone who had been um, a, a preacher in one of the parliamentary, in the, the parliamentary army. So he'd been a, a chaplain in Cromwell's armies, um, and he is driven, as a result of the Five Mile Act, um, to set up um, a gathered congregation, which ch consists most chiefly of all uh, of the kind of lesser officers and enlisted men in the in the Commonwealth Army. Um, he had direct connections with um, Fleetwood, with Charles Fleetwood's house in Stoke Newington. Uh, and there's a whole range of people around um, his congregation. Um, and they included um, some, some really interesting people. Uh, one of them was a man by the name of uh, 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 James Barry, uh, who had been, uh, is a, had been effectively in the late 1630s, he worked in an ironworks as an employee in an ironworks, um, possibly as an iron master. But then during the Civil War, he's recruited into Cromwell's cavalry regiments where the, which, and becomes an officer in a regiment. Now, for an, someone who worked in an ironworks to become an officer was unheard of uh, in the period. It shows you how radical Cromwell's armies were. Um, and he fights in the Civil War. After the Restoration, he was imprisoned in Scarborough Castle but he refused to uh, abjure, and he refused to admit his guilt. He's only released in 1667, um, or oh, sorry, 1672. So he, the man spends the whole of the 1660s in prison, effectively, for his religious and his political beliefs, and for fight, having fought against the king, but then settles in Stoke Newington, and is, becomes part of the kind of group around Owen and Fleetwood, and becomes a market gardener, um, and uh, market gardening was one of the growing industries of Stoke Newington in, in the period. 
um, and lived the rest of his life. He, he, he lived to an old age in the 1690s as um, a market gardener and a member of the, the congregation. So when we think about the, the, the um, uh, Newington Green, you have to remember that around London, there are whole, during this period, there's a whole range of meeting houses that are being built uh, and in, in domestic dwellings, specialist meeting houses. This is an exact, uh, Samuel Brewer's meeting house in Stepney, um, uh, an example near Mile End of that, that kind of red belt, that nonconformist belt around London. A lot of these um, religious houses um, didn't, the, the, none of the buildings survive or very few because they either get rebuilt as the case of, Stoke, of Newington Green or there some of them are torn down in religious riots. Um, there were examples of Anglican riots against nonconformists these in the early part of the reign of Queen Anne uh, that get torn down uh, in this period and, and you can see an example of that and there's an, another example of uh, the destruction of a Presbyterian meeting house by a church and king mob because these kind of Anglican mobs. Um, nevertheless, they survive, and they survive because they have peril, powerful backers um, uh, in, like Fleetwood. Um, an, another good example of, of a kind of second generation uh, elite backer is Thomas Abney, Sir Thomas, who um, come, becomes a member of one of the city guilds. Uh, he also joins the East India Company. Uh, he becomes, um, despite the political repressions or because of the political repressions of the earlier of the 1660s and 1670s, he emerges as one of the leading figures in the so-called Whig uh, period, uh, who are instrumental in overthrowing James II in 1688 and bringing over William in, from, uh, as William of Orange, uh, as a Protestant monarch who will guarantee the rights of merchants. He also helps to found the Bank of England, which was founded in this period. And through a marriage to another nonconformist family of Mary Gunston, he acquires Gunston House, which becomes Abney House. And like Fleetwood House, Abney House is one of those, it's, it, you can imagine the impact of having this nonconformist, very well-to-do Whig politician, Lord Mayor of London, East India Company merchant, um, uh, governor, the, one of the governors of the Bank of England, or uh, on, the, on, the, on the, the board of the Bank of England, um, owning land and becomes the Lord of the Manor. Of course, the Lord of the Manor is, is also, it has real political power in, in the locality. So, and, and can to a certain extent help to guarantee um, that, that, that further entrenchment of nonconformity in the area. And um, as I'm sure you're aware, that, that has long term effects. So, um, his, after his death, his wife has a very long uh, life. Um, he began under his period, uh, the great nonconformist um, um, theologian, but also hymn, hymn writer, Isaac Watts, probably the most famous hymn writer in the English language, lived at Abney House and, uh, and, and, and uh, produced music there. And it's also in that context that the 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 of nonconformity that the nonconformist uh, academies are founded, and the academies are like alternative universities. Uh, nonconformists couldn't get into Oxford and Cambridge in this period, and so the the these series of academies, and there there are about twelve academies that are founded from Stepney and Hackney into uh, Newington Green, Stoke Newington, Tottenham. Um, in this period, uh, offered um, new types of education, often in English. Uh, it was during this period that very famously uh, the nonconformist ejected minister, Cromwellian minister, uh, Charles Morton, comes to Newington Green and founds uh, Morton's Academy, which becomes one of the most educationally innovative institutions in England. It specialized in teaching uh, new forms of learning in English, uh, emphasizing natural philosophy, um, natural philosophy, which was, is what 17th century educationalists would have called science. Um, a lot of the new ideas of the early enlightenment are being propagated through the nonconformist academies. Um, it's, this is the period when 
uh, the area is becoming, if you like, a kind of gent very genteel suburb of London. And um, the people like Daniel Defoe are attending the nonconformist academies in, and settling down. And, and, and um, uh, their kind of commercial life, their social life rev revolves around these institutions. Um, just to give you a kind of flavor of the sort of politics of this, Samuel Wesley, who's the father of the founder of Methodism, John Wesley, um, thought that the educational system at these academies were subversive. And in a, a, he started a kind of pamphlet war over um, what he saw as the subversive uh, curriculum at Morton's Academy. And in this long rant, he talks about how Milton's apology was in being read. Milton, John, John Milton, the great poet, who was a Republican, uh, his apology was a, uh, an apology for Republican forms of government. Uh, he, as you can see, um, he's also saying that they read the most lewd, abominable books that ever blasted the Christian eye, including, it was said, some works of um, uh, 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 pornography that were being read by the schoolboys. I'll, I'll pass that over. So um, I think that's probably a good point because you've sort of seen how the institution comes into being. For me to at least stop uh, and invite you to comment and perhaps for to read out um, comments, criticisms, points of view. Um, so may, I, I, I'm going to stop there. And maybe if, uh, can I ask if anyone's written, Amy, could you look in the chat box and see if anyone's, uh, and maybe read out people's comments or people could just come in and make statements? Yeah, sure. Um, the chat box was fairly quiet. So I guess maybe people, if you're happy to just uh, unmute yourself, if you have something to say, it's not a huge group, so I'm sure we can probably just manage it ourselves. But if anyone wants to to comment or have anything, I mean, I I think I was the only person who made a, a comment which was about the primitive communists, but you kind of picked over that with the diggers and the levelers and things like that, um, Mike. But um, anyone else? Um, Liz? Hi, Liz. Yeah, I mean, um, thank you, Mike, for that really interesting talk. Um, so I'm a member at New Unity, but I'm also the chief officer of the um, National Unitarian um, mm. Movement. Um, and one of the things, I've just been in the role just slightly more than a year, and one of the things that I've been thinking about in sort of how we find our path forward is learning from all of these people, uh, you know, these times that you've been talking about, um, particularly because I see so many similarities with the strange times that we find ourselves in now. Um, so I'm just really interested in from your, your experience, your, um, your knowledge, sort of what you think the Unitarian Church might be, should be doing in, the, in our future. Uh, well, that's a good question, because I'm not, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, um, or maybe what you, if you, if you think some of these, how, these radicals were around today, what do you think they would be doing? Well, um, I was saying, I was saying to Amy um, before I came on, is one of the things that really I became very interested in was because I'm not a specialist in the history of Unitarianism; it's just more more generally of London. Was um, the approach that Unitarians took to uh, the abolition of slavery. And I would have thought that, that probably the, the kind of debates around um, policing, statues, um, protest movements, what, what all that means, is something that is touching London in a very important way. And that's sort of where I think, you know, it's, it's, I, I'm only speaking personally, but it's, it's something I think it's affecting 
the minds and, and hearts of millions of people across at least two continents. And, and it feels like, you know, that, that um, our societies are going through really, not just because of COVID, but because of that sort of a, a moment of looking backwards, looking forwards in terms of Britain, empire, colonialism, um, uh, enslavement, legacies. So something like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very struck by, I was just very struck by the Unitarian story in relation to that. I don't know whether or not that's sort of too much looking thing, looking backwards for you and sort of say, well, you're going back to the you know, 1830s, what, what you want to look forward. But certainly to me, that's really, you know, that engagement with what's, what's happening now in London, that would be one thing that I think that is impossible to remain silent about. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Hi, just go ahead, Deborah. Sorry, yeah. I was muted. Go ahead. That's okay. Sure, sure. Um, th th thank you very much, Mike, first of all, for, for this really super interesting uh, talk, kind of overwhelmed with all the information. Um, and thank, thank you to Liz for that question. That was, that was very uh, thoughtful and lots for, I think, our group to like to uh, consider in that respect. But a, a specific question to Mike's uh, talk today, and that is about the dissenting academies. Um, you know, from what I understand and what you've mentioned, they achieve such excellence in the, the, their approach to education and the content and the forward-looking kind of uh, philosophy involved. What happened to those dissenting academies? Did they each, each one of them morph into something different? Did they disappear? Uh, what, what happened? Because when the dissenters were no longer, were no longer excluded from, you know, positions in government and in church, what happened to this, the, the dissenting academies? Well, I mean, the dissenting academies were alternative universities. Yeah. And, and um, I, I guess, you know, like the, dis, like the dissenting movements themselves, um, as restrictions on dissent became lessened, the need for that, that sort of idea of kind of separation and the uniqueness of that of those institutions started to decline. Uh, and so if you wanted your child to be educated and you could go to a, one of the ancient universities, you would. And so, um, uh, and then also you have you know, places like in London, by the 19th century, University College, which was you know, deliberately secularist or uh, ecumenical, kind of takes the place of the dissenting academy. They, a lot of them survived as um, uh, sec in secondary education terms because the dissenting academy, as I understand it, like other forms of um, education often catered to children and young adults. So it was almost like a form of education because you go to university when you're 15 in the 16th, in the 18th century, you know, they, they would effectively, they were like six, four, you know, the, the kind of regimentation into tertiary and secondary didn't quite exist in the way it does now. So um, they, form, they, they formed a bridge between university education and, and, and uh, secondary education where they survived, they survived as second forms of secondary education. And um, the, the kind of um, broad grounding in um, uh, the humanities and sciences and so on um, was answered by going to university. The other thing I should say is that um, I think um, by the middle of the 19th century, the kind of moment when it was possible to study everything from geography, history, literature, science, at a very high level, that the idea that you did that had declined at the higher level of education and you specialized more. So you know, the idea that you just be, you, science became a set subject of study. And these were 
I said they were radical and revolutionary, and they were, but they were also kind of in an older tradition of, 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 of grounding someone's study in everything from theology all the way to, to natural philosophy through to history. Through to, and, 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 and you could do that, but by the mid-19th century, that wasn't considered to be appropriate as a way of learning. That you, you okay. know, this idea so I, I, I think you mentioned that there were 12 of them in North London, yeah. about 12. Um, so of the 12, none of them exist in some new form, a new university. None of them, they all um, sort of declined because yeah, they mean, lost customers. The they, and so they lost customers because people could send their children to universities then, even if they weren't. Um, yeah, they all closed and then. Sorry yeah. to interrupt. Are they all closed in the 19th century, in the mid, from okay. the, not the 18th okay, century onwards, as Thank I understand it? But University College, if you want a kind of um, living embodiment of that, it's it mm. comes out of very much a very similar set of impulses. In fact, similar people, you know, people like um, uh, Price's friend and associate, Joseph Priestley, Jeremy Bentham. It comes out of that that kind of in, impulse. So that I guess is is the Descent is the, the 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 dissenters dissenting academy in the, mm -hmm. the in its okay. truest sense. Amy, just to say, I can't see the group, so I don't know if there's anyone else who wants to ask questions. I don't want to dominate if someone else wants to ask a question. No, we have no more questions, and we have a couple of minutes left. So, do you want to take the last one, Deborah? No. Yeah. One else okay. Has on, so. I, I have I have one kind of very personal question. And I, I, I know, Mike, you're not like an expert on um, the Unitarians and, uh, you know, or on Mary Wollstonecraft, but I know that, you know, she in particular, um, I have a specific question about her. She moved to Newington Green in order to start the school, and um, which was not, you know, for all kinds of reasons, mostly her own problems. It, it you know, didn't last very long. But why would someone like Mary Wollstonecraft, who was the Church of England, she was Anglican, why would she be drawn out to somewhere like Newington Green? Where, where, when it sounds as though these areas like Stoke Newington, Hackney, Newington Green, they really were meccas for the this, this people, dissenters. Why would someone like her, was that unusual for someone like her to move out there? Or was that just part of a pattern? I, I'm, I'm, I, I'd really love to give you a kind of answer to that question, except to say, I, I, I seem to remember reading that she was encouraged to do so by someone associated with either Price or the, uh, another member of the Price circle. Okay, so um, she had a personal and, connection. And, and it's, not, it's not as though, you know, it, it, I think, the most moving thing that I think is when you see children playing on the green and you hear the sounds of children playing on the green, that's what it would have been like in Mary Wollstonecraft's time. You know, you would have okay. had children playing, mm -hmm. people, you know, um, it was, there was, there was more than one, I think there were at least three um, educational institutions on the green mm -hmm. in her time. So, or at least, in the mid 18th century so it's it, um at, and it's not just uh charles morton uh there's about three other institutions that continued into the 18th century so it was an educational center it was a place okay. that was that was associated okay. with 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 uh with education okay thank you for that thanks great well i think that's everyone um who had a question that's been answered if they put it in the chat or unmuted you um, okay. thank you so much Mike for your time today and for all of the all of that that you you put together for us it was really I think that's exactly what we were looking for when we discussed it in the radical readers group before it was a, a kind of context to we know a little bit about our chapel about the meeting house but we don't know you know, there, there was gaps in knowledge for a few of us, myself included, about the, the general history and um, to have so much information about the local area as well, like about Fleetwood and that kind of stuff. That was fascinating. I didn't know anything about that. Oh, good. So, I'm glad there was some stuff much. that you hadn't done. Uh, that, 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 does, that does please me because I was, I was 
I was concerned that it was too general. So no, I'm not glad, at all. I'm glad that it, it helped in some ways. And um, thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Thanks, Gosh. Mike. And thanks everyone for, for joining us. If anyone has any ideas of, if, of any talks or anything they'd like to learn more about or anything like that, then just get in touch with me and I'll, I'll see what I can do. Whilst we're still very much in online world, it means we have more possibilities. So, okay. well, thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.